I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always nice to know there's people in the community that have that vested interest in the school and that are willing to listen and learn and know a little bit about what's going on and some of the challenges we're facing and hopefully help be a part of uh, moving our school corporation forward in the future. I, this is my fourth year as superintendent and I've thought since I started in this position, you know, I really should do some kind of a uh, community outreach to do a better job of educating the people in the community as to what really is going on with our school, with all of the changes that are happening statewide and with everything that's coming down um, on the education systems and how that just directly impacts us here at Caston. And so this year we're going through a, a school improvement initiative and this kind of fits in with some of the things that we've been challenged to do through that process. And so uh, we felt like this would be a good time to kind of combine this. We had a little open house tonight and there's some other things going on. And so uh, again, thanks a lot for coming. I'm gonna start with just a, a quote that I found, and this is from a, the uh, Superintendent of the Public Instruction in Montana. And I, I really, when I saw this, I thought this just really aligns with my beliefs because I do think that our public schools, uh, the kids who go through the public schools and come out with an education, obviously some of them are more successful than others. Some of the kids take advantage of more than others, but those opportunities are there for those kids, and th this really is what strengthens our community, what prepares kids for the, the world that they are going into, and you know, we really look to our public education institutions to do that for our communities, and that's our, our constant challenge here at, at Caston. You know, we really want to make our kids better people so that they can serve our, uh, our communities and ultimately our state and even you know, beyond that. There are three things that have really happened and I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the finance into schools and I know schools shouldn't be all about the money but unfortunately um, it is a lot about the money because it takes a lot of money to run a school system in, in this day and age. and. Um, there are, th there are three things that have happened over the past eight or nine years that have just significantly impacted the way money comes into our public schools. One of those things, if in 2008, there was a major shift in the way our money that comes into our general fund, uh, the way that worked. And prior to 2008, our local taxes supported a very good portion of our general fund. So we had the ability as a school corporation, uh, based on the needs of our school corporation, to adjust our local taxes and levy through those taxes to meet the needs of the school corporation. In 2008, the state decided that uh, the state would take over the funding for general fund and that this money would come from sales tax revenue. And so, as a result of that, local school corporations lost a lot of control over the money coming into our schools that goes into our general funds. And then in 2009, Governor Mitch Daniels cut uh, approximately $300 million out of the state education funding. And to this day, we have never uh, really seen the return of those funds back to our education funding. And then in 2010, uh, property tax caps came along. And this is something that further uh, limits the, um, the control that we have and the amount of revenue that we are able to raise and bring into our schools. Another thing that's been a significant impact has been, uh, for the first time in the history of public education, we have money going to private, and charter schools. And uh, charter schools, according to uh, information that was published in the Indianapolis Star, uh, charter schools are reaping more money per student than, than many of our public schools are. In fact, $665 more per student uh, in a recent uh, 
compilation of research on that. Also, Indiana is the largest in the nation in voucher programs, and right now, most recently, about 40,000 students in the state of Indiana are receiving vouchers to either go to private schools or charter schools, and that's approximately $260 million of state funding that's no longer coming into our public schools, it's going elsewhere. And that's never happened before in our history. So that's impacting funding. This is what cast and state funding looks like since 2009. And you will see that starting, if you, if you look across the chart, uh, in 2009, our funding was very close to $5 million for our general fund, uh, about $4.8 million. And you can just kind of look across the years and look at the graph and see what is happening to our state funding. Um, in 2018, this coming funding year, we're predicted to have about $4.1 million, so about $900,000 less, eight or $900,000 less than we were receiving back in 2009. You can also see what's happening to Caston's enrollment. And this is a trend that uh, it's difficult for us to control. Uh, back in 08, 09, you can see that our enrollment was up there close to the 800 student mark, and kind of teetered up in that uh, for a few years, and then it started to decline. And uh, 17, 18, our enrollment is at the lowest that it's been at under 700 students. Why is this happening? And you know, I. I was just talking with someone tonight as our chamber uh, members came in and, and you know I grew up in this community I, I live on the farm that I grew up on I can see my house when I look across the field from the school and I can remember as a kid riding my bicycle around a four square mile uh, trek of, of roads around our farm and every house that I drove by my sisters and I as we rode our bikes had kids living in those houses that came to cast it you know, as the bus would go around that four square mile, it would stop at each one of those houses and pick up two, three, four, uh, I think one house even more than four, four kids that came to Caston at that time. Last year, I, I drove that same four square miles and uh, there was one Caston student living in that area. His name was Eli Douglas, if any of you know him, my son, and he was a senior, so he's, we no longer have him here at Caston. And some of those houses that were there back in the 70s and 80s are no longer even standing. Farmers have torn them down, they're farming the farm ground. And that's kind of the story of our rural communities. You know, the, the families are uh, no longer living two and three generations off of a three or 400 acre farm plot. Um, instead, many of them it's not enough to even make a living off of, so they're either having to rent that ground out, or, uh, you know, we, we know what's happening in rural communities, and unfortunately, it has really affected our enrollment here at Caston. School funds is kind of difficult how to, to, to really understand how that works, but we receive different funds, different sources of revenue that go into different funds and I kind of think of this as a silo and this is something that those of us who grew up in rural communities we understand the concepts of silo and what you put in that silo comes out the bottom of that silo and it doesn't come out of the one beside it and um, that's kind of the way our school funds work the general fund is our uh, our largest fund that is our money that comes from the state that is our state funding and it pretty much pays for the bulk of the expenses of our salaries and benefits for almost all of our staff. We have only a handful of staff members that are not paid out of our general fund. Uh, it would be our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, and just a couple of our technology people are paid out of different funds. Everyone else in our school corporation is paid out of general fund. And that is the the bulk of that fund, the highest percentage of that money goes to salaries and benefits of our employees. We also have to take all of our utilities out of that fund, um, our educational supplies, our office supplies, 
and even the supplies for the maintenance of our grounds and our buildings. So that, that is our main fund, and again, all of that money comes from the state. And in, historically, our general fund has been a pretty healthy fund for us. As, as I mentioned, prior to 2008, that money was locally levied, and we were able to raise enough money in our general fund to meet our needs and oftentimes money that exceeded our needs. So we were able to bank that money for uh, future needs of our school corporation. And uh, just a few years ago, around 2013, you can see that we had in excess of $3 million in that general fund. And then you can see what is happening to that surplus balance just in the course of about five years. That balance has started to trickle down to now being closer to $2 million. So we're starting to see that surplus being depleted. And, you know, why is this happening? Well, it's pretty obvious um, why that is an issue for, for school corporations like Caston and these small rural school districts. Uh, first of all, our funding that comes from the state is uh, per student funding. So we get X number of dollars per student that attends Caston. And if a student leaves Caston, guess what? The funding leaves with them. So right now we're getting about $6,200 per student from the state. And if we lose 10 students from Caston, we lose about $62,000. And you know, that's equivalent to a salary and benefit package of a teacher that's you know, a top of the pay scale teacher for us. And, but unfortunately, it is very difficult to reduce your cost of running a school in proportion to losing your kids. If we lose 10 kids from Caston, we might lose one student from kindergarten, we might lose two from third grade, we might lose one from fifth grade and one from eighth grade. And so, you know, when you look at that, what's really changing about the needs for educating the kids at that grade level? We can't get rid of a teacher at that grade level, and, you know, our salary and benefits are the main amount, or the main portion of that general fund. Our programming doesn't change because one child left. But yet, you know, we are losing those funds. And that really has started to make an impact. Um, as our enrollment dropped quite a bit over the past several years, you know, we have reduced staff. So we have had teachers uh, retire. We've not replaced those teachers. Uh, many of you remember the years where we had three, sometimes four sections of every grade level in the elementary school. And now we're down to about two sections in every one of those grade levels. And, you know, we've done that through, fortunately, through reti retirements and just natural attrition of our staff that you get to the point where, you know, you've, you've cut about what you can cut. Unfortunately, when you get to the high school level, uh, cutting a teacher often equates to cutting a program. And we don't want to do that unless we absolutely have to because we want to be able to provide the most that we can possibly provide for our kids. We're also looking at increasing costs, and this is just, uh, you know, happening no matter where you are, no matter what, what you do, the costs are going up. And the costs associated with running school corporations, um, if you factor in cost of living uh, over since 2008, uh, those costs have just continued to increase. And unfortunately, uh, at the same time that that's happening, our revenue is declining. And so, um, Inflation makes it even worse, and I took our 2009 state revenue of almost $5 million, $4.9 million, and if you factor in the cost of living index to that today, that same amount of money would be $5.6 million, almost $5.7 million. So in reality, today, we're operating our school with what would be the equivalent of $1.4 million less per year in our general fund than we were running our school in 2009. And that's, that is a challenge for us. There's another side of revenue that comes into our school and that's our local taxes. And our local taxes are primarily raised in our community, in, in our state, through property taxes. And so, you know, all of us that are property owners, we, we pay those property taxes. 
portions of that come back to the school. Um, in 2017, we're predicted to receive about $2 million in local property taxes from Fulton and Cass County. And there are funds that those local property taxes support. One of those is our transportation fund. And we collect those local dollars, they go into the transportation fund, this pays for our bus drivers, this pays for our fuel, it pays for all the costs that are associated with transporting our kids. It does not pay for school buses, and a lot of people don't understand that, but transportation funds do not pay for school buses. There's a separate fund for that. The other fund, another one of those funds that is funded out of our local taxes is our capital projects fund. And this is money that we use uh, to maintain our facility. Um, it is a capped fund, and this is something that our property tax caps has impacted this fund. Uh, we can, we're capped, so we can, we're limited as to what we can collect into our capital projects. And it, it, it ends up being about 23 cents per $100 of assessed valuation in our community. The state also has made an allowance. And they have said, school corporations will allow you to collect about an additional 6% or about an additional 6 cents for us, it would be 6 cents, in your capital projects and we'll make an exception and we will allow you to utilize that money to pay for utility costs. Our school corporation has never exercised that option. It's not been an option forever. It's been an option for the last several years. And the reason it's been an option is because so many school corporations were getting into fines in their general funds. So that the state came through and said, we'll give you a little relief and we'll allow you to do this. Our board did not opt to do that because they did not want to, to further tax our local taxpayers unless we absolutely had to. So we have tried to pay those utilities out of our general fund, but when we started to see that you know we're eating more of our general fund than what we're bringing in in revenue from the state, we're gonna have to make some adjustments to keep things uh, in, in, in line. We made the decision that in 2018, we will have to shift those utilities to our, our capital project. And, and actually, we're one of the last school corporations in the state to do that. Uh, we've held out for quite a while on that. In 2019, I'll talk about some changes that are going to happen. Uh, it would no longer be an optional uh, thing for school corporations. It would be a requirement. So we're doing that about one year earlier than we would have had to, to do it anyway. <coughs> Another fund, I talked about school buses, the bus replacement fund is solely to replace school buses. And when we buy a new school bus, the state says you've got to leave it on the road for at least 12, 12 years. If you take it off the road sooner than that, you've got to have a really good reason for doing that. And so we have a schedule and we just try to replace those buses and retire them off at, as they uh, work through that cycle so that we can keep our bus fleet up and running and safe for the kids. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard comments, but we have a very nice fleet of buses, and our, uh, that is something that many school corporations have struggled tremendously to keep up with replacing their school buses at the rate that they need to. And we've been very fortunate that we have been able to do that. And as a result, you know, we don't have a lot of buses breaking down on the roads and problems with getting kids to school. So we're very thankful for that. Another account that comes from local taxes is our debt service. And the sole purpose of this account is just to pay off our debt. And Caston is currently, uh, again, we have some of the lowest debt of any school corporation in the state. We have two bonds right now that are outstanding. One we took out in 2012, and that bond was utilized to make uh, a lot of necessary uh, changes in the school. We updated uh, a number of things in our classrooms at that time, we replaced all, every door throughout the school corporation, and just did a lot of needed repairs that had, had been long past due. We took out another bond in 2016, and we utilized that funding for the recent renovations to our kitchen cafeteria, and those uh, changes that are very visible that you see that just took place. Uh, that represents about $2.8 million of debt that we have in our school corporation, 
And again, this is a, a very low debt load for a school corporation. We'll raise about $420,000 this year in local taxes to make our payment on our bonds. There's one other fund. We don't collect any tax for this fund, but it's called the Rainy Day Fund. And it's just what it sounds like. We have limited ability if we have some money left over in any of those local tax areas that we collect from. We have the ability to transfer some of that money to this fund. And it's a fund that we can build up, and it just is a fund that we can use for something that comes along that was unplanned for. What is happening in most school corporations, and it's happening in our school corporation more and more, we're starting to pull money from that rainy day fund to offset shortages in general fund. And that's, that's a common practice that's happening everywhere. Traditionally, our school corporation use, utilized that money solely for retirement and severance benefits for staff. We have some major changes that are coming in 2019. Uh, a new legislation was just passed. It was called House Bill 1009. And it is going to be some changes to funding that have not been seen in school corporations in many, many, many years. There is going to be consolidation of these funds, and these funds that I've just talked about, where the money has to go into certain funds, and it can be only be used for those certain reasons. And that they're going to combine now. When we collect local taxes, money that used to go into capital projects and, and transportation and bus replacement, it's all going to go into one fund now. And it's going to be called the operational fund. And the, the purpose of this, uh, our legislators said when they passed House Bill 1009, that the purpose of this was to give schools more flexibility and to not tie their hands so much. So that if you had a year where you really had a lot of needs with your capital needs, you could put more money in that area and maybe less money if it was a year you didn't have to replace school buses and you could have some flexibility to shift that money around. The other thing with this fund, it will automatically uh, allow schools or it will automatically levy for schools what is called their max levy and it will also increase with the cost of living. And so the, we will see a little more money coming in each year, but again that's coming from our local taxes. That's not coming from the state, that's coming from our local taxes. The general fund is going to go away, and this is what is going to be very uh, unique because I, most people who have, are in education that have been in, in education for 40, 50 years have never known a time that there was not a general fund. And it's going away and it's becoming the education fund. And there are going to be some restrictions on what this fund can be used for. The state is saying if we're going to give you money, it can only be used for direct educational purposes. And so um, salaries of instructional, your teachers, your teacher aides, or your instructional assistants, um, your building principals, people that they can directly link to classroom instruction that's going on will be paid out of this education fund, as well as education supplies, things that are, are going directly into the classroom. But you remember I talked about general fund, you know, we're purchasing all of our supplies now out of general fund for our buildings, for our grounds, we're paying many personnel that are not directly related to the classroom. So what are we going to do with all of that? Well, we're going to shift it to local taxes. And that's going to be a, a mandatory uh, requirement for school corporations. Many of the expenses that we currently pay out of our general fund will be shifted to that local tax side. And um, we'll, we will have to support those needs through our local taxes. For Caston, with our current budget, this represents about three quarters of a million dollars of expenses every year that we're currently paying out of general fund, money we get from the state, that we're going to have to find a way to meet those needs through our local taxes. And this will, this will happen in 2019, so we're just a year off of this occurring. We have, right now, for us, we have 13 employees in our school corporation that are currently paid out of general fund, their salary, their benefits, that will go to operations. 
um, all of our utilities will go to operations. Property and liability insurance for our corporation will go from general fund to local taxes. And then all supplies needed for maintaining our buildings, our grounds, all of that will be paid now out of our local taxes instead of being paid out of our general fund. So the question becomes, how can Caston bring in additional revenue to cover those expenses? And, uh, you know, for us, that's going to mean additional local taxes, one way or another. Um, we will have limited ability to transfer money from the money coming from the state, that educational, to operations. But you can only do that if you can show that it's in excess to the needs that you have for educational needs. And it, as you can see, with our balance coming down in that general fund, we're eating out of that balance every year, which tells you right now, we're not taking in enough money from our state funding to cover all of that to start with. So we probably will not have a lot of surplus that we can uh, transfer to that local side. We may have some, but, but it's not going to be a significant amount of money. So you, when you collect more taxes, um, you're either going to have to raise the tax rate, which you have limited ability to do that because many of those rates are capped, or the assessed valuation of our community is going to have to increase. And that's the, the value of everything in our house or everything in our, in our school community, our homes, our farm ground, our businesses. And so, you know, what might happen in a community like ours that would increase the assessed valuation? Well, we would have to have a very large industry come in or a large business come in, or we would have to have uh, someone come in and build multiple housing additions or something that would suddenly increase the value of, uh, of our school district that we tax. This is just a little illustration of what how assessed valuation and a tax rate affect one another. So you can see at the side those numbers would represent that the, the tax rate if we were taxing um, 85 cents on the dollar of our assessed value or on the hundred dollars of our assessed valuation. So as that assessed valuation increases, and in this illustration I showed it going from 300 million up to 350 million. So if our assessed valuation to, were to increase 50 million dollars in our school district, our tax rate would go from about 83 cents down to about 72, 73 cents. So that that just gives an illustration as assessed valuation goes up, tax rate comes down. Another way that school corporations get money from the local side to offset expenses, if they cannot raise sufficient funds through their local taxes, is they do a tax referendum. And this is where they go to the ballot and they ask the taxpayers in the community can we tax a little bit more and can we get more money coming into our school? And the voters have the ability to vote yay or nay to that. And if the voters in the community say yes, you know, we believe in our school corporation, we want to support that. If we have to pay an extra 10 cents or 15 cents on our tax rate, we're willing to do that. And then if that were to pass, that would be for a period of eight years. And then after the end of eight years, the school corporation would have to go back to the voters and they would have to ask for that again. Indiana has become a referendum state. And um, this, this is something that, I'm, that's not my judgment. This is what our politicians have told us. This is what uh, finance people have said. Indiana has become a referendum state. And more and more school corporations are being forced to go to their local taxpayers and say, we need to, to have this referendum passed so that we can bring more money in to operate our school. Two things are happening. School corporations that have rapidly growing uh, populations in their school district are having to go out and do referendums to, referendums to build buildings because they can't build fast enough to accommodate their kids. They're getting so much money from the state 
to educate the kids because more and more kids keep coming in, but they can't afford to build the buildings because that comes from local. So they're happy to go ask for referendums. School corporations that have declining enrollment and that are getting less and less money from the state to educate the kids are happy to go to their communities and say, we need a referendum for operating. We need more money to operate our schools. So you're really seeing both sides of that. This chart shows that 89 schools, school referendums, have occurred since 2009. Prior to 2009, it's been a, a, a legislative uh, option for school corporations to do referendums for many, many years. But you never heard of schools doing that. It was a very rare occurrence. Since 2009, 89 school referendums have been to the ballot, and approximately two-thirds of those have passed. Uh, the one that we're probably most familiar with that did not pass was a school just north of us about a year ago. It was very controversial, and that was Argus School Corporation. They did not pass a referendum. And so what would be alternatives to increasing tax revenue to continue operating our school uh, well into the future? Well, you would we would have options. We could make cuts. You can make cuts in personnel. That's where the majority of the cuts would have to come from because that's the majority of our budget. We could cut programs. We could cut expenses. Um, but, you know, we all know what the outcome of that is for our school district. It's less services to our kids. So. That's not a, always a, a good viable option for us. We can consolidate with another school corporation. We, we can either consolidate our whole school district or we can consolidate our services. And this is something that we're hearing a lot in legislation right now. Our legislators are really pushing for consolidation. They will tell you we're not pushing hard to consolidate schools. We're pushing very hard to consolidate services. And, you know, those are two different things. And we, we, we're looking into options for that. We, we've talked about, you know, what might it look like if we had in our high school, when we need to offer an AP course that maybe we only have four or five kids that would be signing up for that course. What would it look like for us to have a virtual classroom where those kids could be in that classroom and via distance learning, they could be Skyping or or, or communicating with a teacher who may be over a pioneer in a classroom on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and at Caston on Tuesday and Thursday, we're sharing this teacher, but our kids are able to stay right here in our building, take the course. And so, you know, those are things that we're really having to think outside of the box and think, what could something like that look like at Caston, utilizing technology and some of the things we have available now so that we can still give our kids every one of those opportunities that they need to go on and be successful, but we can make it work for us with our size and our numbers of kids. Uh, many school corporations are turning to private and foundation funding. And uh, I started out my career in West Lafayette School District, a very much a lighthouse district in our state. And they have a foundation that is pouring millions of dollars into that school corporation every year. They also have very different dynamics in their community than we have. They have a lot of money in that community, uh, highly educated, they have a university sitting in their yard, and so sometimes those initiatives are a little easier in those communities than they are when you get out in rural districts such as our area. Also, another thing that would help our school out tremendously would be if there would be changes to the state funding, and if they would structure that state funding in a way that would give some relief to small rural school districts like ours that have declining enrollment. As long as the dollars are tied to the kids and we lose the dollars when the kids go out the door, um, that, that's going to continue to hurt school corporations like ours. And I personally have been lobbying very hard at the state level. I've been in touch with our legislators. I'm a part of a small rural school association and with a number of superintendents that are working together. We we work with our legislators uh, probably five, six times a year. We're sitting down at the table with groups of our legislators, really trying to help them understand how the state funding formula is impacting our schools and urging them to reconsider the way that they're funding. Um, it's not worked so far. There hasn't been much success with that, but we're not giving up. So we just keep trying and, and uh, strumming that string, uh, string on our banjo.
getting away a little bit from money, but still, you know, tied to some funding. Uh, we are building, and, and you know, just sitting in this room, this is a, a really good example of how we took something that was built 50 years ago, made the needed changes and, uh, changes and brought it up to speed to where it needs to be today. But that's kind of a never-ending process when you're in a building that's 50 years old. We are fortunate. Our facility has been extremely well maintained, and our community has taken pride in this, in this facility for years. But there are many things that continue to need to be addressed. Uh, some of those things are things that you will never see. Uh, we have some needs in our water treatment plant right now that we're going to have to look at making some changes there to make sure that we're uh, in compliance with everything we need to be and that things are operating. We have a, a heating and air conditioning system in our school corporation that's uh, been up there on that roof for several years that at some point, you know, we're going to have to upgrade. And uh, so we are getting ready to do a, a facility study. We've been working with Barton Covilema, uh, an architectural firm out of the Fort Wayne area. They helped us with this cafeteria project. They work with a lot of small schools very similar to Caston. And they are going to come in and do a facility study so that we can develop a long-range plan and really thoughtfully uh, address what needs to be done in the future to keep our facility functioning smoothly, to bring things to more uh, efficiency. Uh, you may not, may or may not realize it as you walk down the hallways, but all of our lights in our hallways, all of our lights in our common areas, our, our gymnasiums, this new cafeteria are all LED lights. And we expect our utility bill as a result of that, just the little that we've been able to do in a year's time, that it will probably lower our utility bill by thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of money for us at Casting. You know, that that pays a teacher's salary or that buys a lot of educational supplies that can go into the classroom for our kids. So we're looking at ways of doing things that will Granted, we have to spend a little bit of money, but it will hopefully save us money that can be better utilized for education. We also are in an era where we have to market our schools. And 20 years ago, none of us ever sat around and talked about marketing our schools. Kids lived in a district, they went to that school, and it was what it was. You know, here's what you get, and you know, you're like it or not, this is where you're going to go to school. Kids didn't have any options. Today, families have options as to where they choose to educate their child. And so as a result of that, we've had to really think, and our, our school board has been very proactive in uh, wanting to embark on initiatives where we positively market our school. And we have kind of hung our hats on these things that are unique about Caston and things that uh, are very attractive to some people in other communities, and that's that you know our small size. It's it, you know it's a blessing and a curse for us because when it comes to funding, it's a curse. But when it comes to educating kids and the kind of environment that that provides, it is a huge blessing. And so we feel our small size is something that we can really market, and we can really say you know this this is something that is going to help more kids succeed in school. We know your students by name. They're not just a number when they come to Caston. It's a nurturing environment that kids are likely to succeed in. Um, kids that come to Caston, we may not have the number of different sports. We may not have the number of different clubs, but we have a nice variety. And guess what? If you come to Caston and you really want to be a part of that, you probably are going to get to be a part of that. You know, if, 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 I'm pretty sure Tony Slocum would have taken, you know, any kid that could have stood up and, and walked in a straight line this year to stand on the sideline of the football team because we needed the numbers. So, you know, if kids have a desire to do it at Caston and they want to work and they can keep their grades where they need to be, they get to participate pretty much in anything they want to. And that cannot be said for every school corporation. So that's a big plus for us. And We've been competitive with bigger schools, and we have had many successful graduates, so that has really positively marketed our school. Here's what the impact has been for us. You can see in 2009 the number of out-of-district students that we had at Caston, and then just going across, we have 103 out-of-district students this year. And out of when you have less than, seven, than 700 students, that represents a large percentage of our students. We're getting students from 
every direction, and uh, that's been uh, something that families have, have chosen to send their kids to Caston. We take in far more students than we lose to other school districts, so I think that really speaks well for our school system, and it speaks well for our marketing initiatives. I went the wrong way there. Yeah. The best marketing that we have are our community ambassadors, and that's you guys sitting out there. Um, our parents and our students who go out and, and talk well about what is happening with their kids at Caston, talk to other, other people. I don't know how many families we have had call us and say, um, we'd like to come and look at your school. We're considering that for our child next year. And, you know, so we say, of course, let's set up an appointment, you know, we'll, we'll show you around, we'll talk with you about the needs of your child. Often, those parents will say to us, because I've talked with so-and-so, and they've told me about what's going on with their child, and that's what we want for our child. So that, that is by far our most powerful marketing. Um, so we really encourage those of you in the community, I, I say develop your three-minute elevator speech, but you know, think about if someone were to ask you about your child's school, what might you say to them that would shed a positive light on that? And our community is doing a great job with that. So thank you all for that, because we continue to need your help. There's some changes that are going on that's going to impact those of you particularly that have kids in high school or as the kids are, all of you that have elementary kids. The major changes in graduation requirements are on the horizon for kids. And um, the, it will affect the class of 2022, which is next year's freshman class. Um, we don't know 100%. There's still a lot of debate as to what all will be the requirements, but it's going to look very different than a high school diploma looks right now. I can tell you that. Um, kids are going to be required to choose a graduation path. And they, they're, again, there's debates as to what those paths will look like. And um, they're going to be, have requirements in high school to do things like work study and community service. And uh, we're, we're hearing a lot about workforce readiness. Indiana right now has a ton of jobs that are unfilled by workers. And we're hearing this from business and industry all over the place that we need kids that can come out of high school and that have workforce ready uh, skills. And so there's a lot of that trickling down and pressure that's coming on the high schools to prepare those kids. It's not so much the actual skills that the kids will do in the workplace, it's the workforce ready, uh, it's, it's kids having a work ethic, it's kids knowing that I've got to go to work every day, I've got to be able to get along with the people in the workplace, I've got to be willing to collaborate. Those kinds of skills are what we're hearing over and over and over from our, employer, from our employers that uh, we're not finding this in our workforce and we need it to be able to be successful in Indiana in our, in our work. Right now we've got some, I think, excellent proactive initiatives going on in Caston. Our, our board has provided excellent leadership to really say, you know, we need to put ourselves out there. We need to be looking ahead. We can't be the last one to jump on the bus with some things. And so in 1516, we did a strategic plan. And we focused on educational, we focused on finance, and we focused on policy goals at that time. Um, we have looked at energy efficiency initiatives, and as I said, we've done a lot with our lighting. Um, we have had presentations to our board and public work sessions on solar energy, on some things like that. But, you know, our philosophy is anything that we can cut in energy, we can put into classrooms for kids. So that's, that's been a huge initiative to really investigate that and see what we can do. And uh, as I mentioned, we're getting ready to do a facility study that will really help us focus and plan ahead and make sure we're doing the right thing at the right time. That's much better than stomping out fires and always fixing the problem that came up the day before. And, and trust me, we do our fair share of that too. So um, we're looking at ways that services can be streamlined. And I mentioned the classroom, the virtual classroom, and that's just one of many examples of 
things that we could do um, without having to add more staff. There's so much now available with technology, and I've really changed my whole attitude on that. I used to think that you know kids can't possibly get the same experience via distance learning that they can get in a classroom with a teacher. And it, it is different, and, but those experiences are preparing kids for what they're going to encounter when they leave the doors of Caston. You know, that is going to be their work uh, environment. That is going to be the way they learn in post-secondary education and in the technical schools many of the time. So we need to prepare the kids for that. So I think while we can look at it as a cost savings, we can also look at that as it's a great way to prepare our kids, and we need to be doing that. We also are participating in economic development initiatives um, in Fulton and Cass County um, to really try to make sure that when decisions are being made for the community that Caston is at the table and, and that we're a part of that and that we can have those positive relationships with our area businesses and people in our community and uh, so we're, we're devoting time and energy to that. And just working on educating our community and just th these kinds of things that we're doing like tonight, you know, people need to understand what's going on. I, I hear a lot of comments out in the community and they're well-intentioned comments, but people don't have an idea. You know, they don't understand at all what they're talking about because they don't live in this world. And so we need to do a better job as a school corporation of really trying to educate our community and saying, you know, this is what's happening, this is what we're up against, these are the kinds of things that we need to be doing in the future, and we need you on board, and we need you helping us with that. And with that, I would just open up the floor to any questions or comments that anyone has. Um, we are in the future, in the near future, we're going to try to have some focus groups, just, you know, instead of a large group setting, just sitting down with three or four people from the community and talking on certain topics. So if anything that I've talked about tonight is of interest to you and you would like to be a part of that, we would love to invite you to join us for that. These areas, finance and, and future planning, curriculum and program planning, and facility study are three specific areas that we're going to be working on. So. Um, we, we have some sheets that we put out there, and if you would like to put your name down and ask for us to contact you, we'd be glad to do that, and we'll just try to, you know, it may even be conference calls. It may not have to be a bunch of meetings that people go to, but we, we will just reach out to those people that have an interest to get feedback from the community. But I'm interested in your questions and your comments, so if, if anyone has any questions or comments about anything I've talked about, uh, please. Marla? So, is the government and I say government or political leaders backed off of this four-year college, sending all of our high school kids to four-year college? Because that's what it has been for the last ten years. That's a that's a really good question. Marla's question, if you couldn't hear her, is is the the state kind of backing off of the the really emphasis on sending kids to a four-year college because. I totally agree with you, Marla. You know, our diploma tracks really forced us, if we wanted to uh, get the letter grades and, and you know, get the, uh, just the accolades that are, the, the pressure was to have these kids graduating with academic honors diploma and going to a four-year college. And that was the measure for that. What we're hearing from business and industry is, you know, we, we need kids that are coming out of trade schools. We need kids that have hands-on experiences. We, we will take a kid right out of college, and we, or we will take a kid right out of high school, and we will take them into an apprentice program, and we'll train them if they can, you know, if they're mature enough to handle coming to work at that point. And so I do think we're seeing a shift there. I think that... Um, you know, some of the scholarship programs, the dual credits, kids are coming out, many kids are coming out with close to an associate's degree. So uh, a lot of those kids can maybe just go to a community college for another year or so, or to a trade school, get certificated sometimes. Sometimes they are able to do that right through the work, 
workforce. And I can tell you the jobs that some of those kids are getting are very good jobs that they can make a very good living. Welding is, there's a huge need for that right now. And I think if a, if a student were uh, competent in welding and had the proper certification to go into the workforce, they could probably get a job about anywhere and they probably could make a very good wage doing that. Talked about the two new uh, buildings, the educational and the operational, coming out in the year. How's that going to affect the dollars, the use of the dollars that come in? Will that change the amount in our ability to stretch those dollars in different ways? Or how's that going to impact a school like ours? I assume the amount of money is not going to change. So, how will the different categorized cate categories? affect how we allocate those dollars? Well, it, it, you know, that's another good question, and I think in my mind there are still some questions for that, but you're right, Jason, the amount of money is not going to change. It's just going to shift where we have to pay those different expenses. The, the, where it becomes problematic is that we have limits as to what we can collect in local levies because of tax caps and because of some other things. So. Um, just because we have greater demand for paying things in those funds does not necessarily mean we can just go out and levy additional funds. So that will be our challenge. Where do we get those extra dollars that are needed if we're not able to cut some of those costs or you know, shift some funds one way or another? Um, the rainy day fund is not going to go away. We'll still have ability to transfer some money to rainy day and use that more flexibly as needed. So that provision is still going to be there for school corporations. But my gut is the state funds coming for educational fund, they're probably not going to put a lot of restric restrictions on that initially, but they're probably going to start hammering down on limiting the amount of money that that can be used for anything but education that's going to really lock you into that. So I, ultimately, I think it's going to put more more of the requirements for taxation on our local taxes. I think the state is shifting that back. Any other questions? I, and you know, you may not want to ask a question in, in public or you may think about something when you get home. Feel free to give me a call. I'd be glad to talk with anyone and um, hopefully you've learned something tonight uh, that you didn't know when you came in and have a little bit better understanding of what's going on in our schools, what we're facing in the future. Um, and you know, a lot of people, I, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention, and this is a question I get a lot and it's, you know, why is it that we can't give our teachers a pay raise or we can't um, hire a new uh, teacher to offer this program or that problem or program, but yet we can build a new uh, facility or we can remodel our cafeteria or we can do this or we can do that. And the reason for that is the money coming into those funds are restricted for those uses. So our capital projects money that we collect to uh, to do things for our facilities, we could not use that money to pay a teacher if we wanted to. So those funds are restricted, they go into those silos, they don't come out, and, and so that's why sometimes on the surface it appears, well there's money there, surely if they can afford to do this, they could do that, but that's not always the case. So, um, some, again, just something that a lot of people don't understand. But I thank you all for coming tonight. Oh, Jack? What's your prognosis for the health of the Catholic school district? How do you see us in here? You still going to be here? I see casting here. I'm, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. I, I really believe this community will support a school. I think that um, as long as casting can be a viable educational institution and we can continue offering for our kids what they need and we can continue having kids go out and be successful graduates, I think our community will support and want a school here. Um, so my prediction is we'll be here, but I also believe education is going to look very different 10 years from now than it looks today. And I, I think Caston is no exception to any other school district. 
we're all going to have to adapt and we're all going to have to change. And we're going to have to think outside of the box and be very creative in the way we provide our educational services to our kids. And if we're not willing to do that, I don't think we will survive and I don't think any school will survive. So kind of a two-sided answer there, but um, I, I think our school will be here in 10 years and I think we'll be going strong. Now, I may not be here in 10 years, Jack, but some of them will be and they'll do a great job. She will. She'll be here. Thanks so much for coming, guys, and I really appreciate it. And again, I'd love to talk to any of you that have a question or a comment. And have a great evening. Let's love it.